This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is David Kennedy, who is the McLaughlin Professor of History Emeritus at Stanford University. He won the Pulitzer Prize for Freedom from Fear, the American People in Depression and War, 1929 to 1945. He is the 2009 Jefferson Lecturer on the Berkeley campus. Uh, Professor Kennedy, welcome to Berkeley. Thanks, glad to be here. Where were you born and raised? Well, I was born and raised in Seattle, Washington. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Well, uh, looking forward to what I think will be the core of our conversation today, my parents were very much uh, victims of the Depression. Uh, so the, the whole aura or the lessons of the Depression, such as they understood them, was very much a part of my upbringing. My, my parents were married in September of, pardon me, August of 1930. Mm -hmm. And uh, my father was working at a mining camp in the Cascade Mountains in the north part of Washington State, very remote location. It was snowed in all winter long. This is the day before snow cats and so on. It was a two-day snowshoe trip to get out of there in the winter to a cleared road. So anyway, they came back from their honeymoon and uh, the company had built a little two-room annex on one of the buildings for them to live in. My mother was going to be the first work, uh, woman ever to winter over at the camp. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was the good news. The bad news was that in the same interval, the company had gone bankrupt. And my father was unemployed, best I can determine, for seven years uh, till he finally got a job on uh, working in the grocery store at a PWA project at Grand Coulee Dam in 1937. So that, that was very much uh, the lessons of my childhood were very saturated and marinated in that kind of uh, immediate background in our family. And, and what, what, what was the impulse to become a historian? Was it just something that came uh, as a result of where you were educated and what interested you? Well, not really. It was, it was as I think a lot of these things are, it was quite accidental. I was an undergraduate at Stanford, and I came there to be an engineer. And I was an engineering major for a couple of years. And then I encountered, as it happened, not one but two very uh, influential and charismatic uh, history professors. Mm -hmm. uh, one, a guy by the name of Wayne Vucinich, who taught uh, East European Balkan history. And then David Potter, who was an American historian who had an enormous uh, influence on me. Uh, my running joke with them in later years was if they'd let me alone, I would have become an electrical engineer and <laughs> gone to work in Silicon Valley and then I could have endowed their chairs. But, but in fact, uh, they deflected me and, and I became an historian. Potter in particular was, uh, was highly influential on me. Yeah. And uh, where did you do your graduate work? At Yale. At Yale. And you had decided as an undergraduate to be a historian. Uh, yeah, about halfway through my undergraduate life, uh, history seemed to be the thing to do, you yeah. know. And who did you study with at Yale? Well, the, that was the heyday, the, the golden age, I guess you might say, of the, of the Yale History Department. So I studied with some really wonderful masters. Um, Ed Morgan, who's still alive and writing. Mm -hmm. In fact, I just received galley proofs of a book of his yesterday. He's 93 years old, still writing. C. Van Woodward, who uh, is now deceased. Uh, John Blum, who was my doctoral dissertation supervisor, is still alive. Uh, and Howard Lamar uh, was another person I worked with a great deal. And what was your dissertation on? Well, it was, uh, for that time, it was a quite an unusual uh, topic. Um, it was a, uh, a study of the birth control movement in the United States, mm -hmm. which necessarily meant it was in part at least a, uh, largely biographical about Margaret Sanger, who's the woman who started that movement and headed it for many, many years. Uh, so it was a topic in women's history at a time when women's history hadn't yet become fashionable. Uh, and it was about a topic other than high politics and strategy and diplomacy mm -hmm. when those were still the regnant things that people studied. 
So uh, I, w I won't share with you, I won't burden you with how many uh, bad jokes I had to suffer <laughs> through the writing <laughs> of that dissertation about what the devil was I doing with such a topic. But uh, it, it turned out to be, ex uh, in fact, absolutely endlessly fascinating because it took me into areas of religious history, medical history, legal history, and so on. So I, I don't regret it at all. And, and that's a characteristic of your work, really, that you, you really look at cultural matters, social matters, economic uh, uh, military history and so on as you do this this broad sweep which uh, another example of that would be your book on World War one well in, in, as a matter of fact by, by some strict definition I'm not really an historian my, my PhD program was actually American studies not history I see. Uh, and in my case that meant that my my curriculum or my program of study course of study was two parts history one part economics and one part literature mm -hmm. and I, I put that together deliberately I, I just from the outset I wanted a broader angle of vision on on the entirety of the American experience and I thought I could get just in the history department itself. So there is, there's a certain method mm. uh, and a rather deliberate method uh, to that kind of training and I hope, uh, as you say, uh, that uh, that's characterized my work as well. Uh, which raises an interesting question because uh, I want to talk to you a little about being a historian and that is how do you come to your topics basically? Is it the times that you live in? Is that one aspect of, of choosing to work say on what you did you know, in the first instance uh, on your dissertation? Well, I think it varies a lot from historian to historian, scholar to scholar. Uh, and in my case, it varies from project to project. Um, the, the, the dissertation research, which ended up uh, being published as a book called, rather artlessly titled, Birth Control in America, The mm -hmm. Career of Margaret Sanger. Actually, that was a, a kind of second choice. I, I, for odd reasons that needn't concern us here, I suppose, I, I, at that time in my life, I could speak pretty good Italian. And I thought I would become an historian of Italian immigration mm -hmm. to the United States and do a comparative study of the consequences of Italian migration to the United States and to Argentina, which it turns out is a country that received a lot of Italian immigrants. Mm -hmm. For a variety of reasons, that didn't work out. And in conversations with the various people at Yale, they probed, you know, why do you want to work on immigration and so on? And the short answer was, well, what fascinates me is how absorptive this society is, how it can receive people who are abs they arrive absolutely on the margins, the outer fringes of the society, and over a generation or two or three, they make their way into the, weave their way into the general fabric of the society. So somebody, the, this, the light went on in somebody's head, and they said, well, what about women? And this, and this is in 1964 mm -hmm. or five, so it was before the feminist mm -hmm. movement had really picked up momentum. And uh, by the same token, a light went on in my head. I, well, you, could, you could write something like that, or mm -hmm. you could study that general subject in the case of women, not just immigrants. So then the question became how to get a handle on it. And it turned out I learned that Margaret Sanger had not one but two archival collections of her papers, one at the Library of Congress and one at Smith College in which no one had worked. So then it just went on from there. Now, I wrote a later book about the First World War which I think almost surely grew out of my engagement with and preoccupation with the Vietnam War in the 1960s and 70s. That's when I started work on that book. Uh, why did I get started on the book about the Great Depression and World War II? Well, the answer to that one is actually very clean cut because it, it's, it was published in a series edited by Van Woodward and published by Oxford University Press, and they asked me to write that, the, that volume in, in that series. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a simple one. And, and you, you wrote the book, when did the book come out, uh, the Depression book? Uh, 1999. 1999. And how long did it take you to write it? Well, uh, by some manner of speaking, I, I was at work on it for 11 years. Uh, mm -hmm. That's how long it was on my desk. Mm -hmm. But I do teach uh, virtually every day and I have other obligations, so it, it wasn't 11 years full-time work, but uh, it was a long time. Uh, before we talk about the, the, the Great Depression uh, and, and that period uh, uh, of the war afterward, uh, I, I'm curious, how, what skills do you think a student should have to become a historian? Well, I, I don't think there's any definitive answer to that, but I'll tell you a story. I, I taught for a year uh, at uh, Oxford University in England, and I got to know a group of 15 to 20 or so undergraduates pretty well. And to be frank, I was a little disillusioned uh, mm -hmm. at their, the quality of their historical thinking and their imaginative range. Uh, they just seemed to me not very 
not very interesting students. And there were two exceptions to this. Uh, and I learned only much, many months later, toward the end of the academic year, that those two exceptions were in a very uh, small special program at Oxford in history and economics. Mm -hmm. So that reinforced a, a notion of mine that um, historian, history by its very nature is synthetic and it's eclectic, mm -hmm. and, eclectic and holistic, or it should be at least. And one of the, 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 the prophylaxes that we can adapt to uh, ward off uh, kind of a narrow parochialism just mm -hmm. talking to each other, I think, is to expand our disciplinary toolkit, to economics or philosophy or political mm -hmm. science or religious studies or literature or whatever it might be. And it just gives us more to work with and more perspectives on a topic. So I think any, any young student, uh, young scholar starting out uh, ambitious to make a career in history, I think would do well to learn some of the vocabulary and protocols of uh, one or two disciplines beyond history itself. Mm -hmm. Which, which uh, actually points to my next question, which is when, when you look at the, a book like your, uh, your book on freedom from fear, uh, it's, a, it's a, an accumulation of a massive amount of data. But the data is then transformed into a sense of the time and a sense of the sweep of history. What, is that the secret to the craft of history? Well, I, I, this was drummed into me by a lot of my mentors at Yale, particularly John Blum and C. Van Woodward who would say uh, repeatedly that if we're only talking to ourselves, we're not doing our duty. That we, we, it's, it's obligatory on us as historians that we speak to the broadest educated readership possible. And that means we have to master the craft of narrative. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to drum this into my graduate students as well. The narrative is our friend. And narrative has its own conventions and its own necessities. And they, they, they need to be understood. And you need, how to, need to know how to use that that instrument well. Uh, and the histories that we remember from Thucydides and Herodotus forward are the ones that uh, tell a good story and embed analysis within the narrative framework. I, I just think that's absolutely imperative. Mm -hmm. Let, let's talk now about uh, freedom from fear and what we can learn about the, uh, the Great Depression and the New Deal uh, response. And I guess the first question is on what dimensions uh, is the current economic crisis comparable to the Great Depression, and, and to what extent are they not comparable? Well, let's start with some of the more easily measurable things. Well, one, one thing we should begin by saying, uh, if we date the onset of the Great Depression of the 30s from the stock market crash in 1929, which is actually not the best place to start, but that's what it's conventionally, where it's conventionally started. And if we date the origins of the current crisis uh, from, let's say, the collapse of Lehman Brothers in September of 2008, by that, if we lay the, the timelines alongside each other, uh, we're now uh, about, f what, four, five months into this crisis. If we take the clock back to the 1930s, that means we're at approximately March of 1930. So among the things that we, if we're going to compare these two events, we have to compare the very early period of the Depression with where we are now. And among the, th the thoughts that that leads to is that at that moment, in the spring of 1930, nobody knew that the capital G, capital D Great Depression was what was coming at them over the horizon. So ignorance about exactly what's going on, what its causes are, what its scale is, what its momentum is, what its duration is likely to be. Uh, we have to remember, history is remembered backward, but it's lived forward. And people in the spring of 1930, I would say, in fact, well into 1931, did not understand exactly what it was that had swept over them. So we don't know what the future holds. We have better data uh, than they did about things like the unemployment numbers and so on. Uh, and we think we're more sophisticated in terms of economic theory. We think we have a better institutional structure in the government of this country and others. We have better multilateral institutions internationally. All that's true, but we don't know uh, precisely what the deepest dynamic of this crisis is and exactly. The present one, yes, yeah. this one, and where, where it might take us. So I think we have to be very cautious about these things. Mm -hmm. So that this, the factor of the unknown, mm -hmm. I think, is, is in a sense the most comparable element between the two moments. Mm -hmm. Now, what, one of the points that you make, which uh, is that, and it's very clear in your narrative, is the, the ideas to understanding evolved over time. 
And so now we, in our present crisis, can talk canes, talk stimulation. But back then, uh, uh, both Hoover and Roosevelt were groping for an answer, and they were still, both of them, tied to old ideas, and maybe Hoover more so than Roosevelt. Well, Hoover certainly more so than Roosevelt, but I agree with you absolutely that the, the, we can see some of the same or quite similar uh, ideological and intellectual constraints operating on both of them. And there's another, I suppose, another example here of uh, some uh, economic policy analog to the old maxim about how generals always fight the last war. Herbert Hoover, 1929-1930, thought, not without reason, that what he was looking at was a crisis similar in kind and on the same scale to the very sharp recession that he had dealt with as Secretary of Commerce in 1921-1922, which he had turned around fairly quickly. And that was among the things that contributed to his very large reputation. Was he, was, he was the miracle man who had turned this recession around after World War I. And he'd done it by calling corporate leaders and state and local officials into Washington, D.C. and urging them to accelerate capital investment projects and hold wages steady and so on and so forth. And that worked. And that's what he did in 1920. 1930, and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do we do now? Uh, what, what's, what's our remedy now? We look back to the last crisis that we think is comparable to this one, and we reach for the same set of tools that seemed to work then. Uh, big stimulus package and liquefying the banking and credit structures and so on. All the things that were invented as new policy tools in the 1930s now look to us to be the appropriate instruments, but whether they will prove to be, we don't know. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, as you discuss the, the, the achievements of the New Deal, uh, it's striking the extent to which that in, in looking at the current crisis, in the last couple of decades, we, our leaders had really been dismantling some of the institutions were the, that were the great achievements of uh, uh, the New Deal. The thinking here of the SEC, the extent to which uh, uh, the, the security uh, of the housing market was destabilized by securitization, strangely enough. Talk, talk a little about that, because is, can, can we use fairly your book to look at this dismantling process that we've witnessed and that apparently led to the current crisis? Well, first of all, th this whole apparatus of, of more or less new government institutions that came into being in the 1930s. Uh, most of them date to the New Deal, although some date to the Hoover period, actually, like the Reconstruction Finance mm -hmm. Corporation. But the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Social Security Act, Fair Labor Standards Act, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, so on, those are all New Deal creations. They worked very well for, let's say, two or maybe even three generations, for half a century. Uh, well down toward the end of the century, or the end of the 20th century. Those institutions introduced elements of, of stability and risk reduction into the economy that in, account in part for the remarkable uh, prosperity and growth of the American economy in the decades after World War II. And I do believe, beginning in the 1980s, and uh, not to make any bones about it, I mean, this was part of Ronald Reagan's great political uh, message, uh, government is not the solution, government is the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, Continuing through Clinton, though. Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely. Yeah. And that, that uh, created a certain uh, inclination or to weaken, or certainly not to update and strengthen, uh, these uh, oversight and regulatory institutions and so on. And I do think that is a contributory factor to the predicament that we're now in, mm -hmm. uh, that we, we got into excessive uh, commodification of credit and uh, risky lending of a sort that those older institutions were meant to prevent. But if you weaken those constraints, the result, in a sense, you might say, is predictable. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are, in a, in a sense, in a predictable uh, predicament. Now, th there is, uh, when you look back at what the New Dealers thought about the world that uh, they we're encountering, and you go back to Roosevelt's speech at the Commonwealth Club, which uh, you, you discuss extensively. One of the themes of the New Deal was that America had come to the limits of its productive power, and that the effort had to be made to rejigger the system. Now, it's kind of interesting that if, if we are fair to Reagan and to Clinton and so on, they thought that ending 
regulation, deregulating, was a way to ensure a new wave of prosperity. So there, there's something about the human condition here and the limits of institutions, but, but it's a similar kind of problem, right? Well, yes, in, 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 up through the 1930s, or in, let's just confine it to the 1930s, the, the regnant economic orthodoxy was something called the mature economy thesis. And many, many very prominent uh, economists believed that uh, advanced industrial societies had reached a plateau of development, and the best you could hope for going forward was to keep things going more or less at that level and distribute the benefits a little more evenly, and that would itself be stabilizing. But no one uh, cogently or, or in any informed way uh, foresaw the enormous growth capacity of this and other economies that was demonstrated during and especially after World War II. Uh, so they lived in a wholly different intellectual world from what we've come to take for granted. I mean, governments now uh, talk about growth daily. I mean, gro growth is their mission is to promote economic growth. That wasn't necessarily the case. Economic stability and prosperity, those were objectives. But the idea that the economy could grow at a 3 to 4% annual rate year in, year out over decades and so on, which has been the case for most of the Western societies and the Asian tigers uh, since uh, World War II, that just wasn't on the screen. So uh, yes, I agree with you that there, that there was a certain reasonable and defensible rationale behind the ideas that uh, Reagan and to a certain degree Clinton brought forward that we've now arrived at a point where growth is its own growth is its own self-sustaining economic mechanism and government should get out of the way and let that happen well uh, appealing as that is as an abstract idea I think we we've, we've seen how it can lead to excesses that uh, could make trouble for everybody and and it's really interesting how the theme that emerges when you you summarize what the uh, New Deal accomplished was transparency, making information uh, available, which was a key to a kind of minimalist regulation that did not seek to undermine the economic system. And of course, that's what we're hearing, hearing now uh, about when we talk about credit swaps, about uh, all the new mechanisms that had been developed. Well, the New Deal for 70 years or so has served as a kind of shorthand in our national political dialogue for big government. That, that's just what people think when they hear the phrase New Deal. But in fact, if you re really examine the New Deal in, in its uh, particulars, you get down to short strokes about what they really did. Uh, what's remarkable to me, what I tried to convey in, in Freedom From Fear, is how um, assiduously the, new the architects of these New Deal policies worked to make these innovations, like Social Security and the Securities Exchange Commission and so on, to make them minimally invasive on the prerogatives and the operations of the free market. Uh, so the, the era of big government, uh, as we think of it, really it may, may have its deep origins in the New Deal, but the New Deal itself was very uh, very cautious about expanding government authority in wholesale ways. Uh, again, compare what happened in this country in the Great Depression to what happened in Western Europe, mm -hmm. um, where whole industries, whole se wholesale sectors of the economies in the continental countries and in Britain were nationalized. The railroads, the automobile industry, the airline industry, the transportation, telecoms, everything. Uh, at one time or another, in virtually every major European advanced industrial country were nationalized. There's nothing comparable here with the single and rather partial exception of the Tennessee Valley Authority. So we, we never went that road at all. Uh, we didn't nationalize the banks, we didn't nationalize General Motors and Ford, we didn't nationalize the railroad system and so on. So we, we have a, it's in our political DNA as a, as a society, we don't, we don't want to go down that road very far. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we've, even the New Deal it seems to me respected the prerogatives of the free market to a considerable degree. Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting that, that Roosevelt was uh, 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 tied, bound, uh, in, uh, imprisoned by some of the old ideas. So at, at critical points in the evolution of the New Deal, he went back to old ideas and uh, uh, cut uh, the budget so that uh, he wouldn't have deficits and he could balance the budget. Well, he, he was less wary than Herbert Hoover mm -hmm. of deficit spending and of uh, expanding the federal debt. But he was not unworried about that. He was concerned about it. So he, he always insisted it was a complete fiction. It made no actuarial or fiscal sense. 
that the deficits of the New Deal years were not on the regular budget. They were part of an emergency budget. Mm -hmm. That's what he would call it. But the fact is, there are debts nonetheless. Yeah. Um, but and the, the design of the Social Security system, which is peculiar to this country, it's dependent wholly on payroll taxes assessed on workers and their employers. It's virtually the only uh, Western, at least, uh, Social Security system that is not financed in whole or in part out of central Treasury revenues. And that's at Roosevelt's insistence. Uh, there's a wonderful passage in uh, the memoir of Francis Perkins, his Secretary of Labor, who was the cabinet officer given the political responsibility for overseeing the drafting and the management of the Social Security Act. And she tells us in her memoir that when she first met with this committee of economic and actuarial experts, it was called the Committee on Economic Security, it was headed by a then prominent economist at the University of Wisconsin named Whitty. Uh, she told them, and this is, it's one of these smoking gun passages, it seems to me, in the record that tells us how they were thinking. She said, I told them to re they had to keep in mind the needs of our country, our legislative habits, mm -hmm. and the prejudices of our people. That's the phrase she used in instructing them how they should put this thing together. Mm -hmm. And what she meant by that principally was what Roosevelt had told her. This will not be a dole. It will not be an entitlement of the sort that you just get it because you turn 65 years old. It'll be tied to your work record, and you will contribute out of your own payroll and the tax into the tax system that supports this, and there'll be no Treasury money in this thing whatsoever. So there, there's another index of how wedded he was to the what you might call the, 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 the enduring precepts of our political culture. We're wary of central power, we're wary of big government, and when, even when we undertake a big government initiative like Social Security was, we try to do it in a way that uh, minim minimalizes government, the government presence as much as possible. Uh, a key element of your narrative <clears throat> is the political genius of Franklin Roosevelt. And uh, in the first instance, you compare him to Hoover, and uh, in the case here, in the case of Hoover, we have uh, a humanitarian, an engineer, an internationalist who basically couldn't move to the to the next level. So, talk a little about uh, the fact that. On the one hand, Hoover gets a bum rap, but on the other hand, you show that he really was uh, making an effort uh, to respond to the crisis. Yeah. Well, uh, to use an old cliche, you know, the, 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 the Depression was a lemon crate and uh, Franklin Roosevelt made lemonade out of it and Herbert Hoover just never figured out what to, how to handle it. Uh, but I do think there's something, there's a deeper subject here about what we might call, broadly speaking, uh, the political arts. This has fascinated observers from the time of Aristotle and Machiavelli right down to the present. What does it, what makes for effective political leadership? And it's, it's a, an elusive question. We don't, there's no formulaic answer, no algorithm that lets us answer that. Uh, Roosevelt was a lifetime politician, and he was an extremely capable politician. And there's some element of mystery in what exactly made him such an effective politician. Hoover was, I think, every, even his sharpest critics would acknowledge, one of the most intelligent men in the United States. He's one of the biggest personalities this country has produced in the last century or so. He had enormous accomplishments to his credit. Uh, organizing the food relief program for the Belgians during World War I, running the Food Administration in the United States during World War I, arguably the most effective Secretary of Commerce ever uh, during the 1920s. Uh, huge empirical knowledge of the details of the banking system and the capital markets in this country. A very good engineer, made a fortune as a young man with, with producing real things, doing real things, mining projects in Australia and China. So there's no question about his competence and his intelligence, but he was a lousy president, he was a, and he was a lousy political figure. Roosevelt, who was dismissed by a lot of people as a as Walter Lippmann, famous columnist, who once called him an amiable boy scout uh, column that Lippmann probably later should have been made to eat without salt, but the uh, people underestimated him, but he had some kind of elusive political genius that made a big difference. And, and you, uh, you in, in one point, you make a comparison that if, if uh, some bankers came in to see Hoover, he could go over all their data and their books and analyze it, whereas in the case of Roosevelt, if you brought him a political map of the country, he could show you who the bosses were and exactly. where the votes were. Exactly. This, this is an anecdote that goes back to the 30s. I, I think it's accurate. It certainly captures something that is tr true about both these figures. 
that Hoover, if you pointed to a county uh, on the map, any place, Nebraska, Iowa, Missouri, wherever it might be, he could tell you uh, what was the state of the banking system in that county, because he just he'd, he'd internalized the data. Whereas Roosevelt, he'd, he was a parlor trick that he played. He'd have somebody draw a line across the map of the United States, and he would trace his finger along the line and tell you exactly who, whether Democrats or Republicans or whoever was in control here and here and here, and who was the congressman, who was the senator, who was the local boss, all the rest of it. Well, it's two, two different ways to approach the business of governing and one proved effective and the other wasn't. Yeah, I just I was left with the sense that it was as if uh, Roosevelt had read your book <laughs> you know <laughs> but of course it hadn't been written so that so that he I, I mean because again and again although you you say that it was said of Roosevelt that he didn't read books but he talked to everybody he 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 listened he always wanted to have his uh, his ear to the ground and he had a remarkable sense of timing. Yes, yeah. Well, let's go back to the, the mystery of this political leadership again, and particularly the way in the 1930s it had to do with the ability to use or not use well the newest uh, communication media of that day, which was the radio. Radio was about 10 years old by the time the Depression comes along. The first broadcast, I think, was in the early 1920s. Uh, Hoover, Coolidge used the radio. I believe Coolidge's inaugural was the first that was broadcast on the radio. Hoover used the radio fairly regularly to talk to the public and so on. But when Roosevelt came along and initiated these fireside chats, of which he delivered 30 over the course of his presidency, it was a wholly new way to make political use of that medium. Uh, after the first fireside chat that he gave in March 1933, in the following week, in one week, the White House received over 400,000 unsolicited letters from people who heard that broadcast. I've seen a lot of these at the Hyde Park Roosevelt mm -hmm. uh, Library. A lot of them are written online, school tablet paper, a butcher paper, all kinds of them, very ungrammatical, spelling very original and so on. Ordinary people just felt this connection. Uh, in the Hoover White House, there had been one employee to handle mail from just random citizens who wrote. After this first week in Roosevelt's White House, they had to hire more than 100 people to, hi to handle that correspondence. So Roosevelt did something. Again, it, it, its mm -hmm. precise definition eludes us, but he touched people. He got in touch with them. He communicated with them. He made them feel loyal. He, he attracted their, their interest and their energy and their affection mm -hmm. in ways that are mysterious but prove very, very effective. And, and as, a, as a politician, a premier politician, he he was seeking to build uh, a long-lasting coalition, yes. basically, and he didn't have all the ideas at hand, but he was, he was kind of really ready to try everything and to move on it, and then if it didn't work, try something else. Well, he said things like that. If yeah. one thing doesn't work, let's try something else, and the people demand action, 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 and so on. And that has become part of his mystique and his historical reputation. In a, in a way, I think it's too bad that that's the case, because in my view, he was quite a strategic and quite a, a visionary. And he had a vision of where he wanted to take the country as a whole, and I think the, the, the core element in that vision was security, making life more stable, less risky, more predictable for bankers and home mortgage lenders and individuals in old age and the unemployed and the sick and so on, so on, everybody. And I think another part of his vision, as you just said, was to build a political coalition that would cement this more strategic vision for the society as a whole into place, keep it uh, pr politically protected for at least a generation or so, which he did. He formed the fabled New Deal Coalition, which dominates national politics at least into the 1960s, if not even later. That's, that's a pretty impressive achievement. Mm -hmm. And again, here's a, a, a metric of how deliberate this was and how we, we make a mistake if we think he was simply opportunistic and didn't have a plan. In the 12 years of the Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover administrations, the three Republican administrations of the 1920s, those three presidents altogether over 12 years appointed exactly eight Catholics to the federal judiciary. Mm -hmm. In the first two, two terms of Roosevelt's administration, eight mm -hmm. years, shorter period of time, he appointed more than 50 Catholics mm -hmm. to the federal judiciary. Well, what does that tell us? That he was, it was there was a long-term, coherent, strategic vision 
of recruiting to the Democratic Party the political loyalties of these new immigrant communities that had arrived about a generation earlier, around the turn of the century, which were heavily Catholic uh, in character. So and that, that's this is working class ethnics and Catholics who, and Jews uh, who come into the, the de Democratic coalition and make it the regnant, the dominant uh, coalition for the next three decades. Mm -hmm. and, and as a sailor and as a politician, he had to navigate uh, between the left and the right, and also between the institutions uh, uh, that he had to live side by side with in, under our constitutional system. And I, I want to talk a little about that, because you say something very, uh, in talking about his relationship to the left, Huey Long, Father Coughlin, who's, who, who was uh, what we would consider conservative today and a demagogue, but who advocated some things that, that were progressive. Uh, you say that Roosevelt, instead of bending to the left, capitalized on it. Yeah. So t explain that, because I think that is very important. Well, again, I go back to what I said a moment ago. That I think Roosevelt did have a vision. Uh, mm -hmm. and I think he, he, he articulated the vision to himself and his associates in the 1920s, before the Depression ever mm -hmm. came along, uh, particularly about making life more secure, things like old age pensions, universal health care, which was one of his aspirations, unemployment insurance, stabilize the banking system, so on. So those people who think that he invented all this stuff in the middle of the 1930s as a way to stop the momentum coming from his left in the person of uh, Huey Long or Father Coughlin. I think they've got it all wrong. Uh, the vision is there well before that. But when these characters emerge mm -hmm. on his left, Long in particular, it becomes a way he can move and discipline the Congress to go with his program, lest the implicit message was, lest if you don't get with my program, you're going to come under really irresistible pressure to do something far more drastic and probably a lot more risky coming from Senator Long of Louisiana or whomever. So he, he could make political use out of the existence of those people. Uh, but I do not, I firmly do not believe that the, the, the reform program that he articulated and implemented in the 30s happens because of them. I don't think that's accurate at all. And, and in fact, a, as you have said earlier, when it comes to coming to a program of Social Security, which is a response to, to Townsend in California, uh, Huey Long, and, and to a certain extent Coughlin, he understood what the American system could tolerate yeah. as represented by its institutions. So it was a, a pension system unlike the, the other countries of the world had adopted. Yes. Well, one way to summarize that would be to say that the in the United States, old age pensions, so the, what we know as the Social Security system, is brought to the public and essentially accepted by the public as a property right. Whereas in other societies, that very comparable arrangements are understood to be civil rights. They're, they simply accrue to you because of your membership in the society. That's not the way we've we put our system together. It's not the way we think of it. Uh, in fact, the Committee on Economic Security that drafted the original Social Security legislation did not like this financing scheme. They repeatedly said to Francis Perkins and Franklin Roosevelt, "This is not a sound way to do this. We should put we should finance this out of general revenues." And Roosevelt repeatedly said. Don't pursue that idea. I'm not going to buy it. And so, again, it's the prejudices of our people and what will be politically tolerable and regarded as legitimate in our political culture. And I, I do think there is such a thing as political culture. Different countries, different peoples have different cultures mm -hmm. and they have different definitions of what's legitimate. Mm -hmm. and, and there were also problems on the right. And interestingly, you point out that uh, what we have come to call Reagan Democrats, in a way, the, 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 the first emergence of that constituency comes during this period and were the people that Father Coughlin was uh, uh, addressing. And then uh, you also point out that when Roosevelt was trying to get his legislation through, there were conservative Democratic 
uh, senators. I think one named Bailey, who actually wrote a manifesto, which is kind of the, one of the first statements of uh, the conserve what we've come to understand as the conservative movement in our time, but but really has its roots in history. Well, the modern conservatism, by and large, as we usually understand it, in a sense has its origins in the 1930s, insofar as it's, it's one of its foundational principles is opposition to large or enlarged government. There's no, really no philosophical basis for that of any really very meaningful sort until government gets big enough to have something to oppose. So modern conservatism, especially of the Reagan variety of government is not the solution, government is the problem, really has its, its roots uh, in the 1930s. And it's, uh, you mentioned Reagan Democrats. Reagan Democrats are really, there's at least two different flavors of those, it seems to me. One uh, constituent element in that is that uh, the, turns out to be the children mm -hmm. <laughs> of those uh, immigrant uh, communities that were brought into the Democratic Party in the 1930s and stayed there for a generation or so. But their children moved to the suburbs and became property owners and didn't belong to unions anymore and changed their political stripe to a certain degree. And that's what Ronald Reagan and conservative Republicans uh, made political hay out of in the last couple of decades or more of the century. But the other component to, uh, of Reagan Democrats is the South. Uh, and when the South changes its political allegiance from its historic uh, loyalty to the Democratic Party and becomes, at least in federal or national politics, a, a Republican stronghold, as it's been now for 30 years, that changes the whole political complexion of the country. Uh, and that, has, that switch has largely to do with reactions to the racial politics of the 1960s and particularly civil rights movement and affirmative action programs. That, that was the wedge that allowed the Republican Party to capture that disaffected Southern constituency and, and have it make it change parties. Uh, and this takes us back, of course, to a still to this day highly controversial matter about Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal because he would not touch in any very direct way, the racial issue. Mm -hmm. There is one exception to that, but by and large, he didn't. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was pressed repeatedly uh, by people in his inner circle and by Norman Thomas, the head of the American Socialist Party, to take on the issue of racial equality in the South. And he repeatedly said, if I do that, mm -hmm. I will arouse such opposition from these barons who, because of the seniority system, dominate the Congress, that my whole program will go down the drain. We, we'll get nothing done whatsoever. Yeah, you point out, and this relates to our discussion here of the conservative movement and its origins, that, that Roosevelt, uh, in the later part of the New Deal, chooses to attack uh, uh, business. Uh, and you point out, though, that it never really uh, mattered much in terms of the policy that resulted, that this was a political strategy uh, uh, that emerged out of personal pique, uh, uh, his, his dissatisfaction with the, the class that he had uh, come from. So talk a little about that, because that was also the genius of his politics, but it created this hatred uh, of, uh, of him by the business community. Yeah. Well, it's a little, again, it's a little bit of a mysterious matter, because as you rightly say, the, the real concrete palpable results of this were quite negligible. I mean, one that's always pointed to is the so-called soak the rich tax that he advocated in 1936. Um, and it had a very, very high marginal rate. So the highest marginal rate, I think, might have been 90 percent. But the fact is, in the United States at that time, there was exactly one taxpayer who, whose income was over the threshold where that marginal tax rate actually kicked in. It was John D. Rockefeller, Jr. So th this was a rhetorical ploy. It really wasn't uh, confiscatory toward the wealth of the rich in any meaningful way. So we have to understand it as something that operated at a different political level. And the best that I've ever been able to figure out, and it, 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 there is something mysterious about it to me, is that this was a way of consolidating uh, a certain set of political resentments that animated political behavior and much of the working class and the unemployed who they, they took some satisfaction out of having a named enemy and Roosevelt gave it to them in the, in the form of the, the rich and the wealthy and the prosperous and so on. Uh, and I think this was a rather risky and dangerous political game actually and you know the, the usual accusation is that he was, he was creating or fomenting class warfare. I think that puts it too strongly but it does capture some kernel of truth in the matter. It also as many of his advisors told him this will prejudice the case or, or the, 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 the probability uh, for economic recovery. As long as you're 
they're rattling your saber at these people, they're not going to start private investment again, and that'll retard economic growth. There was something to that. So there was an economic cost that was uh, to be paid mm -hmm. for this political strategy. You, you point out something very important, uh, which clearly relates to our present time, and that was uh, uh, that uh, there were two problems for Roosevelt. One was dealing with the Depression. But the other was creating these structural long-term reforms. And that the Depression was an opportunity to do the long-term work. And the contradiction here was that if you solve the Depression immediately, then it might uh, work against yeah. your long-term goals. So he, you're, you're, you're turning on a dime here. Yeah, it, it's, uh, this is a delicate question of understanding and interpretation. Uh, when I was writing Freedom from Fear, I actually spent several weeks looking for some documentary evidence that would be the smoking gun for the thesis that his priority was not ending the Depression but using this crisis to put reforms in place. The closest I could come to that actually is a, actually is a pretty persuasive document, uh, easily accessible as a matter of fact. It's his second inaugural address in January of 1937. Uh, which I always recommend to students and to teachers to take to their students because it's very instructive. He begins that address by uh, talking about uh, the rec recovery from the Depression. And he, as any president would on such an occasion, he's just been reelected by a huge margin and he's reminding people they're better off than they were four years ago when he first came into office. That, that part is absolutely predictable, standard political boilerplate. But then there's this remarkable sentence that when I first read this, it just kind of popped off the page at me. He says, I can quote this almost exactly. He said, but these signs of returning prosperity could be portents of political disaster. Now imagine that, a president saying, yeah, we're, we're better off and we're recovering economically, but this could be a portent of disaster. Well, what did he mean by that? Well, he goes on uh, a paragraph or so later to utter one of his most famous lines, frequently quoted, about how I see one-third of a nation ill-nourished, ill-housed, ill-clad, and so on. The important thing to understand when you read the speech in its context, or read it in its entirety and understand its context, is that that one-third of a nation were not, he was not talking about the victims of the Depression, mm -hmm. the, the people who'd gone unemployed in the last few years. He was talking about what he thought was one-third of the American people who had been left out of the American great barbecue, whatever you want to call it, for a century, uh, since the onset of the Industrial Revolution in this country in the early 19th century. It was that deep structural problem of bringing those people into the mainstream of the society. That was the big question, and the, the, the big challenge. And if prosperity returned too quickly, he was afraid he would lose the moment of opportunity to really put a program that would firmly bring that one-third of a nation into the center of American life. He would lose that opportunity forever. Mm -hmm. you, you compare Roosevelt to uh, Lincoln. And uh, that, that and, and you, you, you say that, to a certain extent, had McClellan in the first years of the war won decisively, then at, at that point the, the Union might have been restored but with slavery. So that it was really time, that, that is the, the, the time of failure, that moved Lincoln toward the Emancipation Proclamation and, and, a, de, and a decisive victory. And, and you compare that uh, to Roosevelt. Yeah. Talk a little about that. Well, the, 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 the comparison with Lincoln and McClellan and the Civil War is something I learned from uh, another book in the series, The Oxford History of the United States, in which Freedom from Fear it was published, uh, a book by James McPherson called Battle Cry of Freedom, which is a, the definitive history of the Civil War for our generation. Uh, and I, I was fascinated by his analysis of what's called the Peninsula Campaign early in the Civil War. Uh, and had McClellan's forces succeeded in taking Richmond in, in 1862 and ended the war within months of its beginning, uh, it's at least arguable, because Lincoln's war aims were not yet 
uh, to abolish slavery, merely to restore the Union. And it's arguable that uh, if the Union had won decisively in 1862, Union would have been restored, slavery would have been intact, and what the future would have held for that institution and for the African American population is anybody's guess. So by the same token, uh, let's just say the, the fabled 100 days in March 1933 had managed somehow or other to restore the economic health of the country in fairly short order so that by the end of 1933, let's say, uh, nine months or so after the 100 days, things were more or less back to business as normal. In that scenario, would there have been a New Deal as we know it? I don't think so. All the, the, the really durable things that come out of the New Deal, like the Social Security Act, the Wagner Act, the banking legislation of 1935, Fair Labor Standards Act, which is the Minimum Wage Act and also prohibits child labor, all those things date from 1935 and after. So it, it took... It took the, 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 a protracted crisis um, and to, to open or create the political space in which Roosevelt could get these things done. And if the, if the economy had been quickly restored in 1933, I think it's quite arguable that we would not have gotten that big reform program and the country would have looked very different thereafter. If we compare that situation with the present situation, uh, after reading your book, uh, and I recommend that everybody who's out there watching this read the book, uh, one is left with the, the, the sense that it's really the long-term perspective uh, in the face of a crisis like this. And to the extent you get caught in quibbles uh, in the day-to-day -day stuff, the day-to-day -day responses, the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, trying to bring in the conservatives, for example, in today's situation, that that you're you're not getting the big picture, because when all is said and done, Roosevelt and the New Deal didn't get us out of the depression until war came, but they put in place institutions, Social Security, SEC, FDIC, that that changed our relationship to government. So is that the lesson for the Obama administration and for the, 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 the voters who are watching him? Well, I think the short answer, I think, is yes. But there are considerable risks in this, and they're not just political risks. You might say, more broadly, they're moral risks. I mean, how politically feasible is it and how morally allowable is it to let a, a, a crisis fester just so you can put in place uh, longer term reforms. Now, some of that I, I'd be prepared to, to get behind, but uh, a, a deliberate protraction of a crisis in which people are really suffering from unemployment and so on, that's a pretty tough thing to advocate uh, full-throatedly. Um, Rahm Emanuel, now, now President Obama's chief of staff, has been widely quoted in the last few weeks as saying that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Mm -hmm. uh, this reminds me of a, an old maxim or old saw about the character, the, the Chinese character for crisis, I'm told, is a fusion of the two ideographs or, or characters for danger and opportunity. Uh, whether that's literally true, I'm not sure, but it's a nice reminder that a crisis does hold both uh, the possibility of danger and the possibility of opportunity. So balancing those, how much danger can we tolerate in order to optimize the opportunities that are on offer, is, that's a very, very delicate moral and political calculus. But, but in, in the context of this long-term perspective, uh, it, it's really kind of... Uh, not the most appropriate comparison to say, okay, what is achieved in the first hundred days? Well, my, my own personal view is, uh, I know this is unfashionable these days, but I think that the hundred days, the, the, the way we've kind of anointed the hundred days as uh, the, the benchmark for whether any president when he comes into office is regarded as on the right track or successful, we've done a great disservice mm -hmm. to presidents in the political system. Uh, and this, this folklore that is built up around Roosevelt's 100 days and how it's created expectations for everybody thereafter, I think is really, really a disservice. The, the original 100 days in 1933, pa uh, the Congress passed 15 major bills. And that's the substance of it. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember all 15 of them off the top of my head, but I think only two of them survived the 1930s, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation legislation and the Tennessee Valley Authority. 
Most of the others are things that go out of business uh, very, very soon. The National Industrial Recovery Act is declared unconstitutional within two years. The Agricultural Adjustment Act is declared unconstitutional within two years. The Federal Emergency Relief Administration, the Civil Works Administration, the CCC, all are gone by the end of the decade or shortly thereafter. So the 100 days is really not a terribly great uh, lesson for us if we, or model for us, if we really look to effective long-term institution building and really deeply changing, stabilizing the political culture. That, the 100 days just doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you think that a history such as this, uh, that you've written, Freedom From Fear, should inform our thinking about current policy? Uh, or is that beyond your ambitions <laughs> as a historian? No, I think one of the, the, the subtexts of uh, freedom from fear, uh, maybe it's not all that sub, maybe it's a little more explicit, is that uh, in my view, uh, the, the reforms that came out of the New Deal were good and positive uh, developments in the longer term evolution of this society. I think making life less risky for millions of people is a pretty good <laughs> objective. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd even be willing, if it came to that, to uh, give up something on the dimension of economic growth if it meant more stability for people. Um, so I think that's, that's one enormously important and positive thing that comes down to us from that time. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I think, is the, the, the New Deal over time worked to legitimate a larger role for government, which is our one collective instrument as we deal with things like this, after all. I think that's good. Uh, within certain boundaries. Um, so uh, I guess the third thing is that the Great Depression experience demonstrated that this our society can suffer great shocks, great insults to our prosperity and health uh, as a society, and we can get over them. That th this too shall pass, that we're, these things aren't necessarily the end of Western civilization as we know it. Well, one final question. If, if you had the opportunity, and you may have had, to speak to uh, a closed circle of Obama's top advisors, what would be the one or two thing that you would like them to get out of this book if they didn't have time to read it? Well, I suppose the, the, the central thing I would like to say is what we were just talking about a minute, moment ago, that this is a moment of opportunity as well as danger. And uh, as I think Rahm Emanuel and others understand, this, this is a, a, a rare chance to get some things accomplished that have been on the national political agenda actually for generations, but have not been accomplished. I think, first of all, universal health care. We're the only Western society or advanced industrial society that doesn't have such a thing. It's high time we did. Uh, it will enhance our competitive advantage in world markets as we spread the cost of health care across the society as a whole instead of sticking individual corporations with them, as we've just seen in the automobile industry. Uh, and it'll make our people uh, happier and healthier. Uh, it's, it's high time for that. Uh, and I think this, this is a moment of fluidity uh, when the system is more malleable in normal times, and we should take advantage of that. On that note, uh, Professor uh, Kennedy, I want to thank you for being here today. I want to show your book because really in an hour we can't do justice to it. So everybody out there should go out and buy it. Uh, and thank you again for being here today. Thank you, Harry. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.